how bodies are produced today is actually not quite simple. It's quite complicated. This flowchart shows you all the steps that's needed to produce biodiesel. You need to dry your sample. You cannot put water or wet sample in there, even though water, uh, oil is immiscible with, with, with water. Oftentimes, you need to do an esterification reaction, followed by this transesterification reaction I just mentioned to you. Another very big step is that you need to do water wash. One gallon of biodiesel oftentimes requires up to eight gallons of water to wash the product. Why do you need so much water for, and why do you need water to, at the first place? It's because the catalyst that is now commercially available is this chemical called sodium methoxide. And this is a homogeneous chemical. What it means is that it goes into methanol and stays in the methanol. It dissolves itself in methanol. So obviously no one wants to put this corrosive, strongly basic things into your car engine. In order to remove that, you need to use some acid. You do acid and base neutralization. You form some salt. Then you use water to wash them away. That's why you need so much water to get a pure biodiesel. All this is layers of additional cost to this operation. Another problem is that you have a catch-22. That is to say, the biodiesel is biodegradable. That ester bond sometimes very easily to get hydrolyzed. The more water you use to wash those uh, the callus away, the easier you decompose your end product. Okay, so therefore, you know, the shelf life of the biodiesel is actually not very long. And also, the methanol contains a lot of water, so you have to use a lot of energy to flash your methanol to recycle those additional methanol for another round of production. So here comes another issue. That is, right now, the growth of the biodiesel plant in the Midwest, as many of you know, start to plateau. The reason is that, so far, almost all the United States biodiesel plant relies on soybean as the feedstock. But if you look at this chart, soybean is not very oily. In fact, it's actually a protein crop. It actually produces more protein than oil. So if you look at this, one hectares of the soybean give you only 446 liter. This is a, a, a chart that I got from a European journal. So therefore, all units are in liters and hectares. But if you look, microalgae, the amount of the oil per unit area, it's orders of magnitude higher than that. If I al allow me to translate all these numbers to you, is that U.S. right now use about 970 million acres of, for crops and grazing. If we want to use the soy produced biodiesel to meet the current transportation needs on the diesel fuel, we need 16.4 trillion acres to be able to produce enough biodiesel to just overcome the transportation needs. So everybody knows if you compare this number with this number, this is a pipe dream. Okay? However, if you use algae, only 20 million acres of the land is needed. And we don't need these for prime land. Any you know, backyard retention ponds or you know, rivers or whatever, coast, coastal area, there are marine algae. This is a great opportunity, meaning that only 2.2% of the existing cropping area is needed to be able to produce enough uh, of the fuel. So a lot of people actually jump into this area now. There is a tremendous amount of activity, particularly in the private sector, pursuing using algae as the alternative fuel source. What are the issues? Well, some of the issues related to how do you get the fat out? So, well, some people think this is an easy problem because you just pick the right kind of algae. There are you know, more than 40 different kinds of algae out there, just fresh water. We're not even counting the marine algae. And some of them are high fat containing, meaning if you look at the Botrychococcus brownie, this is the one that actually typically exists in a colder climate, you can actually get 25 to 75 oil, meaning the, the neutral lipid per unit weight, meaning the dry weight of this algae. So that looks very, very promising to me. That means a tiny little one gives you this much fat. Well, you know. And if you look at the structure of these guys, they're quite clever. You know, so at first I thought that, well, why do they want to produce that much fat? Where are they going to put it? Turns out they put it in the backyard. So this is the cell membrane. They form the colony, and they have cell wall. 
So they put the fat right between the cell wall and the cell membrane. So that's their pantry. So, every, so they don't you know, occupy any sort of space inside of the house. But when they need fuel, they go out and then get some. So that's really cool. Um, <coughs> here comes the problem. So every, bio, every algae producer tells you that, well, the amount of the fat we could give you is so promising. But essentially, in order for these microorganisms to survive, they produce not just the fatty acid or the triglyceride to make biodiesel. They produce a variety of different kinds of neutral compounds. The, all these are hydrocarbons. That is to say, you have steroids. Well, our football player eats a lot of this, right? I mean, it builds muscles and you know, steroids. And then, Good, okay, and then so the so suffice to say, what we're looking at here, only a small fractions of the chemicals that produce from these microorganisms are suitable for fuel applications. Take home message is that we got the alphabet soup. How do we get only the letter A out? For uh, in this case, it should be a letter B it's because we want biodiesel. So now, how do we do that? This is a big challenge. So if I summarize this, only those short chain, meaning less than 20 carbons, non-branched hydrocarbons are economical feedstock for fuel production because they burn well. The current oil extraction has a problem. It, oftentimes, in order to get these lipid out, you have to kill the bug. You have a catch-22. So in order to get the thing, you have to grow them. After you spend all this effort growing them, you have to kill them to get what you want. Well. This is not so bad if these things grow fast. But the real problem is that there is no efficient and economical refinery method to isolate only those fuel-related chemicals from this alphabet soup. Another problem is that the current commercial catalyst, the sodium methoxide, is basic. You got the fatty acid, you got the base, you got no reaction. Meaning that this is the reason why most of the biodiesel producers in the States are using soybean, because it doesn't contain the fatty acid. Why couldn't they use the Mickey's deep fry oil as a feedstock? Because they contain a lot of free fatty acid. The free fatty acid would destroy the sodium methoxide, forming soap. Then you don't have the conversion to biodiesel. So therefore, you have to do this additional step called the esterification reaction. First, to convert this free fatty acid impurity into your product, biodiesel. And this is reaction typically catalyzed by an acid catalyst. Then you have this FFA free oil, then you do your transesterification reaction by doing, using a base as a catalyst. So the dream will be, can we make a catalyst that could serve both as the acid and base? If you could do that, you could, you could save a step and do one step conversion from these waste oil feedstock to biodiesel. And it turns out, so we got the extraction, we got the refinery problem, we have the catalyst problem. So let me first tell you what our visions of the solution of the refinery one. What we did, we made those tiny little sponge balls that I showed you before. Instead of it being a silica, we now made it of a pure carbon. So this is almost like you take those carbon nanotubes, you bundle them up into a spherical particle. Surface area is more than 1,000 square meter per gram. Now when we put the algae inside a little test tube, we sprinkle these carbon particles they went immediately to those algae culture. Almost all colony got hit, meaning they have a high affinity toward those hydrophobic oil species that exist in around the algae colony. So we could use this to sequester and extract the fat from even the hexane. We put a hexane on the algae culture, then we actually uh, could, could extract some of the hydrocarbon into the hexane. Then we sprinkle our carbon sponge ball into this organic solvent here, containing those alphabets, uh, you know, hydrocarbons. Then we actually filter the particle. It turns out our particle has a great selectivity. It only absorbs these guys because of the opening and the unique structure and the hydrophobic natures of these particles. It's, it's, it likes carbon-14, it likes the 15, it likes the 16, and the 18. And these turns out to be great chemical for fuel production. So you got the oleic acid, you got the palmitic, you got so on and so forth. These fatty acids, they are weakly absorbed, so we could also absorb these guys as well. But some of the large ones, like the C20 and the C22, they are actually waxy. They are not suitable for biodiesel production. 
are having no affinity because they're simply molecularly too large to be sequestered and go inside the pores of a particle. So our particle can contribute to this area to actually if economically extract the right kind of chemical out of this alphabet soup from any microorganism. The other problem, as I mentioned, is the catalysis problem. So we have been working pretty hard in trying to create a solid that could do both the acid and the base catalyzed reaction to convert this, the, these FFA-containing feedstock to biodiesel. Our initial thinking was, well, we have the porous structure. How about we put the base inside, we put the acid on the outside, so the acid can catalyze this conversions of free fatty acid to biodiesel. Then the oil can go inside the, the basic domain and give you the biodiesel and the glycerol. Okay, so this was our initial uh, idea. But it turns out what we did was we just simply put an inorganic species, again, I'll skip this uh, to chemical. What we did is we take something as simple as calcium oxide, which is a naturally produced mineral, mixed with the surfactant and the silicate crosslinker. We make a material, our initial idea is to embed these basic calcium oxide as the basic catalyst into this amorphous silica wall, just like the tiny little marble embedded to the wall. And these will be the basic site to convert the triglyceride to biodiesel. So when we saw the performance of this catalyst called the MCS1, we were quite happy with this performance. You could actually see that the, uh, the amount of catalyst with oil, very, very low, less than 8%. And the amount of methanol to oil, also very low, meaning that you don't have to use a lot of chemical for this reaction. Temperature, very mild, boiling methanol. Open air, conversion is quantitative, and you can actually reaction time more than, uh, less than two hours. You could actually recycle this catalyst more than 20 times. So if you compare our results with the existing only two solid catalysts in the, in the world, one produced in France, the other one produced in India, and now being recently, they're trying to commercialize it in the States. They need high temperature, high pressure, and their amount of the chemical is much higher. And so uh, New York Times came here and then did a story on, us, on, this, on this catalyst. So we're quite happy with this performance. And we were also pretty surprised in terms of the recyclability. We, as I mentioned, you could actually recycle this more than 20 times. You didn't see any deactivation of the catalyst. This is not too surprising because this is soybean oil. It doesn't have a whole lot of free fatty acid. However, when we use the chicken fat, we saw this catalyst, even though we're only using 8%, and this fatty acid contains 15%, in some cases even 25 this catalyst survives. So how come that 25% of the fat did not destroy that tiny little amount of catalyst if our catalyst is actually basic? So these are the fundamental questions that we ask ourselves. We know the calcium oxide is basic, so it could actually do the transification reaction to oil, converting the triglyceride to biodiesel. But what we didn't understand was that silica, we don't have any acidic group here, meaning that the free fatty acid should have destroyed the calcium oxide, but it didn't. So what would be the species that are responsible for the esterification reaction, meaning the conversion of the free fatty acid to biodiesel? That was a puzzle to us. Until one day, uh, Jennifer Newick, uh, one of my former graduate students, took the following two spectrums. I will not bore you with the chemistry, but simply to ask you to pay one att attention. Please look at the number, meaning the degree, and where the peak shows up. To your left, this is our starting material. We take the commercial available calcium oxide. We try to embed this to, to, to silica surface. Silica is not crystalline, so it will not show any peak. This is our product before we activate it into a catalyst. So I think everybody could tell the position of the peaks are completely different between the left and the right. That is to say, our initial hypothesis was completely wrong. We did not have a material that contains any crystalline of calcium oxide in the structure. So there is no crystalline domain inside our material. So what could our material be? Can this be some kind of new material that's formed with these elements, meaning calcium and silicate? Turns out, what's out there that is actually mixed oxide? Well, cement. So turns out, if you take a look at the Portland cement, 60% of Portland cements are actually the so-called tricalcium silicates. 
The other 15 is the dicalcin silicate. Both these two will undergo hydrolysis. They will give you the so-called hydrated layer, what people call the CSH layer. Okay? So same thing will happen to dicalcin silicate. Turns out this is nanochemistry. This has a 1.4 nanometer tobomorite crystalline structure that looks something like this. Okay? So the light gray representing the calcium oxide layer, the dark gray tetrahedra are the silicates. So if I turn this 90 degree, you can see it better. You have a slab of a calcium oxide covered with only one layer of a calcium silicate on top and below. Then this unit repeats itself like lasagna, layer on layer. So calciums are over here, silicates are over here. Notice one interesting thing is that the teeth, meaning the silicate tetrahedra, are not touching each other. There's a gap filled with water and other counter ions. So what happened was, our, uh, our spectrum looks very similar to these hydrated cement. Okay? So I told my student, this is a concrete result. Okay? So, well, it turns out, this is the precursor of our callus. Upon the calcination, we see some changes of this guy. Some of the peak disappear, some of the peak remains. So without going into the detailed chemistry, sorry I have to skip the SARS and Mark. This is actually a lot of effort for Mari Pusky, my dear friend, that spent a lot of effort to get the spectrum, but I didn't have time to go through it. Just tell you what happened. Turns out what we did was to take these lasagna structure and start squeezing them so that to the point the teeth of the silicate start to touch each other and connect. So if I could point out, if you look at one of these tetrahedra, it's connected to two of its own kind. So we could call it Q2. When they connect with another one, then you create a new type of silicon that's called Q3. So it turns out when we investigate it, the more of the Q3 you form, the more catalytic active your material becomes. Okay? So, again, this is data from uh, Mark Pruski. Uh, he did a calcium silicon uh, spin counting, uh, silicon 29 spin counting. Turns out the ratio in our most active material, the calcium over silicon, the calcium is the majority. Silicon is the minority. The ratio is 1.7. When you move from here to here, you move from an active biodiesel catalyst to sand. Okay? And the more of the calcium and silicon ratio you go, the activity decreased. This turns out to be the ideal ratio. Okay? So we're still investigating and trying to understand at an atomic level why this is. Okay? But suffice to say, we did some chemic absorption analysis, there are surface acidic sites. So by having calcium marry with silicate, you have both of the acid and base. Okay, so the children inherit the traits from both his parents. Now, by using that, we could actually eliminate 50% of the current biodiesel production process so that we don't need water washing because our catalyst is solid. Nothing goes into the product. We don't need to do acidification. We could do one pot reaction. Okay? Our product is not toxic. We could recycle the catalyst over and over again. With that, we were very happy. We decided to, uh, you know, we were also lucky that a, uh, a venture capital firm in California, Menlo Park, California, uh, decided to give us initially 6.7 million, then now up to 12 million. So we formed a company called Catalin. So uh, I was telling Mike that my heart was broken when I found out C-A-T-A-L-I-N was taken because I initially I wanted to say Catalyst and Lin. Lin is my last name. So we have to compromise and now C-A-T-I-L-I-N. But that's, we decided to pronounce it Catalin anyway. So, um, so now we build a pilot plant over at the, uh, the Bioenergy Conversion Center out in Nevada. Well, many of you know how to pronounce that word, but it took me two years to figure out it's not Nevada, it's Nevada in Iowa. So anyway, now Callan is fully staffed. So uh, right now we have uh, 20 employees in the company. This is myself and uh, Carla and Young were my former postdoc that joined the, the, the company. Jennifer was the, 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 the brave student that took those powder x-ray to figure out has something to do with cement. She joined the company as well. 
Wayne Turner is the uh, VP for operation that we recruit from Dow Chemical. He was the site manager for, for Dow 35 years. CEO is Larry Lenhart from uh, MDV and uh, Dave Sand, uh, who was the sales uh, director at uh, GW Grace and recently joined the Calvin. And the rest, we have a basketball team. All of these guys are 6'4 and above. So <laughs> I look like a midget here, but anyway. So this is our product. We have now produced, uh, I was quite happy, we now produce a ton of this guy. So now uh, we are selling this thing to all around the world. The pilot plan is done. It's, uh, we just recently switched from uh, the batch mode to continuous flow, the fixed batch reactor. So it's now uh, the startup is going to be uh, next week. So with that, I'd like to thank the funding agency uh, and the students. So we, in the group, we have a blue team, we have a red team. The, the blues are the bio team, the reds are the catalysis team. And uh, I'd like to thank Mari Puski for the collaboration, also Kang Wan for the collaboration on the plant cells. And many, many friends and, and uh, students, uh, I owe my gratitude to them. Funding agency should never forget about them, even though they never give you enough money. <laughs> so, so with that, I thank you for your attention and my apology for a long lecture. Thanks. Yes. Uh, and I'll wait for you. Uh, on, the, on the salt scale part of the, of the talk, uh, you have shown uh, on microparticles by the by the cell. Mm -hmm. And you said that uh, it, uh, it uh, coexisted co with the cell. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Uh -huh. So how you uh, manage to, uh, to bring the particle to the membrane and not, uh, and not yes. feeding the anti -doctor? Yes. In fact, um, in the case that I show you, okay, uh, the first cartoon that I show you is the hope that we want to put the antibody as a site directing agent. But all the data that I show you did not contain any antibody on the outside. So, but we did use some, some membrane uh, molecular recognition. For example, the, um, like the um, folic acid, okay, recognizing the cell membrane protein, and that is actually on the exterior side of the protein. What we found is in those cases, the particle gets swall swallowed by the, by the cells, but they tend to get trapped inside the endosome for a very long period of time because of that strong binding with the, with the lipid bilayer. So the mechanism for those, uh, the, the, the entering the cell membrane penetrations, we have investigated that. Turns out right now we saw pinocytosis, we saw clathrin-mediated endocytosis. Those are all protein-assisted endocytosis. So what we found, there are several factors one could play. And one thing I did not show today is that you could even, we published a paper last year, if you could change the shape of the particle, from spherical to rod. Certain type of cell like to swallow the spherical, certain, cell, certain type of cell like to swallow the rod. And why? I don't know. It's very interesting. It, perhaps, if you think about it, a lot of viruses are actually spherical in shapes, and a lot of bacteria are rod. So is there any sort of evolutionary reason behind it? Don't know. But it's interesting for us to continue to investigate. <laughs> Yes, we, we, tr we tried that. Turns out, the, again, the morphology plays a big role here. You could actually get some uh, sequestration, but you don't have selectivity. You, you, you throw the activated charcoal into alphabet soup, you come out with the activated charcoal covered with alphabet soup. That's what we saw. Yes? Of course. The, the, the first cap that you had, was, was that Kazan's profile? 
<laughs> yes, correct. Would, would, would this happen in the church being Absolutely. Okay, so it's not for living no, the reason why we do, uh, use the cadmium sulfide. So, getting magnetized. <laughs> so, uh, so the reason why we use cadmium sulfide as the first demonstration is that the cadmium sulfide is quantum dot. So it's, it's photoluminescent. And the reason why we use that is because then we can study the, the, uh, the diffusion profile, you know, how the cap diffuses away from the, from the, from the mesoporous silica. And so I got that question a lot. And then, you know, the interesting thing is that, as I show you, literally, you just need something that's slightly larger than the pores. Those can be the cap. Right. Anything that can block them from leaking out will work. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got some refreshments over here, and we thank you again, Victor. Yeah, thank you.